Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. There's a couple things today that I'd like to share with you since we last posted. Uh, the first is a uh, comment that was out on Russia Today and several other um, internet blogs discussing the possibility of cracks and smoke and steam coming out of the ground at Fukushima. What they're claiming to have occurred is that the nuclear core has melted through the containment and is now in the groundwater. I was asked by Russia today to comment on that and I declined. I just don't think there's enough good solid engineering data to either support or refute it. It may be happening but um, I didn't think there was enough engineering data yet to make any conclusive um, remarks about it. But it's interesting, the sensational issue of steam coming out of the ground has actually clouded much more important issues which uh, can be substantiated. The first of those was another report that came out last week from California. A group of scientists detected sulfur, radioactive sulfur 35 in the atmosphere. And it occurred back in March, about uh, two weeks after the Fukushima accident began. The press focused on the fact that radioactive sulfur was detected in California, but the report held something that was much more important than that, that didn't make the news. And that's how did that sulfur get created? Well, let's go back across the Pacific now to, to Fukushima. And it turns out that when salt water is hit by neutrons, it creates sulfur. Now, on the nucleus of a, of a sodium atom in salt water hits a neutron and it becomes a different atom called sulfur. That's the mechanics of it. But what the report showed is that 400 billion neutrons in a square, in a square meter were required in order to make the amount of sulfur that was detected in California. That's an enormous number of neutrons and no one asked where did they come from. I think the report from last week substantiates what I told you back on April 3rd. And way back then there was enough evidence to indicate that the reactors hadn't really completely shut down at Fukushima. Remember when the, um, when the tsunami hit, the reactors had been shut down for about an hour. The control rods had fallen into them and shut down all of the, um, all of the chain reactions. But it seemed like there were recurring chain reactions after that. And I think this new data from, from California substantiates what I had been telling you back in, back in April. There were ongoing criticalities after the unit shut down. The, the next thing that's important uh, also, also occurred about two weeks ago. There was a meeting at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission where the NRC staff briefed the commissioners about what had gone on at Fukushima. Now we've posted the, uh, the link to that on, on the side of the video here. But what the NRC staff told them in about the first 60 pages of, of transcript is that the nuclear fuel pools at Fukushima uh, had not experienced much problem. Well, someone called in, there was a call in line, and asked a very important question, and I'd like to read that to you now. The person was, was Mr. Shaddis from the New England Coalition, and he said this, I was surprised to hear you say that the fuel in the spent fuel pool was not damaged. Press reports indicate that fuel particles up to a centimeter or more in size have been found a mile or more from the spent fuel pools? And that's my question. Can you address the disparity? So what Mr. Shaddis was suggesting is if the fuel pools were in good shape and plutonium is discovered a mile or two away, how could that happen? Well, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission response was troubling to say the least. They said, Mr. Grobe, again on page 61 of the transcript says, most of the deposition that has reported to date appears to have come from inside the reactors. And then two pages later, on page 63, uh, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Hollihan says, 
Ascribing these dispersed radioactive materials in various forms on site, you know, it is most likely they were from the reactor cores rather from the spent fuel pool. To my mind, that's more troubling than the hypothesis that the nuclear fuel pools released this plutonium. You'll recall back then on August, um, sorry, back on April 26th, I postulated that there was a prompt criticality in the Unit 3 fuel pool, and there's a lot of data to support that. The flame was on that side of the building, the height of the explosion, and I postulated that that is what deposed, deposited the plutonium a mile or two off-site. What the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is saying is much worse than that. The Nuclear Re Regulatory Commission is saying that the reactors have breached and the containments have breached and liberated this plutonium which has gone off-site. I don't understand their position. Frankly, I don't think it's right. I still believe it's the fuel pools that caused the plutonium to be deposited. But if I'm wrong, and it's not the fuel pools, in fact, the position of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is much worse. If the reactors have failed and the containments have failed causing this, we really need to seriously look at American reactor design. Well, the next thing I'd like to talk about just briefly is that a tent is almost ready to be built over the um, Unit 1 at Fukushima. Now, that's not going to solve a lot of problems, but it's going to solve two problems. The purpose of the tent is to reduce the amount of radiation on site. The radiation inside that tent is still going to have to go somewhere or else it's going to build up and become, um, become lethal. So what's going to have to happen to that radiation? It's going to be exhausted up the stack. Now that's good for the workers because it gets that radiation airborne at a much higher elevation and it's good for the surrounding communities but it doesn't solve the problem of radiation releases from Fukushima. So I wanted you to know that when you see this this tent that's being built over Fukushima 1, uh, it doesn't solve the problem. It pushes the, the, the cesium deposition further away from the site. It's important for the workers that they get less cesium, but it is not on a global basis reducing the amount of cesium load that we're all receiving. And that brings me to my final point. That's that the, the um, deposition of cesium throughout northern Japan is extensive. Now, the Japanese are allowing that material to be burned if the concentration of radioactivity on anything that's radioactive is less than 8,000 becquerels per, per kilogram. What that means is two pounds, about a kilogram, can be disintegrating at 8,000 disintegrations every second, and the Japanese are allowing that to be burned. Here in the United States, that would be considered radioactive waste and would have to be disposed of underground for, for thousands of years. But as long as it's less than 8,000 disintegrations per second, the Japanese are allowing that to be burned. Not only that, and this is actually more disconcerting, they're allowing blending. So if one sample had 24,000 disintegrations per second and another two had none, they combined those so that the three on average have 8,000 disintegrations per second and they're allowed to be burned. Well, that has lots of serious ramifications. First off, it's basically the material that's already come out of Fukushima and is on the ground is now going airborne again, deliberately. So the towns around and areas around schools, school playgrounds that have been cleaned up from Fukushima are now getting cesium redeposited on them by the burning of the material. So the, the clouds of radiation from the different areas that are causing, that are ha having fires in Japan right now are becoming a recontaminating areas that have been sampled as clean or low. And in fact, now we'll see higher radiation. It doesn't stop just at the Japanese border, but of course continues across the Pacific into the Pacific Northwest as well. So by allowing the burning of material, we're basically recreating Fukushima all over again. And we're sending into the air that which has been deposited on the ground. 
There's also some data that the ground deposition is running out into rivers and now into the ocean, relatively far away from Fukushima. So while the focus has been on just the Fukushima site, in fact now we're seeing radioactive rivers further away which are also contaminating the ocean. Japan has a problem, a tough problem. But in order to solve the tough problem, first you have to recognize there is a tough problem. And this constant um, ignoring of the significance of the problem by the Japanese government is in fact making the problem longer and it eventually more costly than doing it right the first time. I think the Japanese need to recognize that they have a problem and it's serious and they have to recognize that it's going to cost a lot of money to fix. But it is fixable if it begins with the concept that there's a serious problem that needs to be solved. Thank you.